Hello and thank you for joining us. I'm Wilson Stribling. Welcome to another edition of At Issue, where we discuss and debate the issues facing the state of Mississippi and how these issues impact you. The 2019 Mississippi legislative session is over and lawmakers have returned to their districts. Over nearly three months, legislators agreed to a teacher pay raise and enacted laws to protect victims of human trafficking, extend broadband in rural areas and limit access to abortions. On tonight's program, we will highlight some of the laws set to take effect on July 1st and how they may affect you. Abortion in Mississippi is tied up in the courts again. During this legislative session, Governor Phil Bryant signed into law a measure to block most abortions after a fetal heartbeat is detected, which could be as early as six weeks of pregnancy. Last year, the legislature passed a 15-week abortion ban, which was struck down and ruled unconstitutional by a federal judge in Mississippi. The 15-week ban is now on appeal in the Fifth Circuit Court. But Hillary Hillary Schneller, a staff attorney with the Center for Reproductive Rights, tells MPB's Ezra Wall they are asking a federal judge to add the state's latest attempt to their pending lawsuit. We asked the court for permission to add the six-week ban to our lawsuit and also for the court to block the six-week ban before it goes into effect on July 1st. So we certainly expect a ruling uh, before July 1st. How soon could Mississippians reasonably expect to see some sort of finality in this legal process? That depends a little bit on what the state decides to do. Like they did with the 15-week ban, the state could decide to appeal the six-week ban decision to, you know, higher courts. And so it may take some time for there to be finality, but we expect during the litigation process that the laws will be blocked so that we can preserve access to abortion in the state. I think the one thing about abortion bans in particular, bans on abortion before viability, are the state saying that it is the state who gets to decide whether a woman continues or ends her pregnancy, but the Constitution clearly says that it is for the woman to make that decision and not the state putting itself in the middle of this personal decision that can affect women's lives. Republican Senator Angela Hill of Picayune championed the legislation that many refer to as the heartbeat bill. She tells at issue producer Ashley Norwood protecting the life of the unborn is the right thing to do despite the court challenges. Well, I do expect it to be tied up in the courts like every other pro-life bill that we've passed. But, you know, we have the attorney general's office that's there to defend these cases and we fund that office um, whether we're defending cases or whether we're not defending cases. So I don't see it as any extra burden to the state of Mississippi. Anything else you want to say about this issue? I remember the first debate on the Senate floor it was very emotional for a lot of women, including yourself. Why is this bill so important to you? It's so important because as a society, we have begun to value animal life, um, endangered species lives, uh, turtle eggs, like I said on the floor. Um, we, we have put in more protections in the law for endangered species of animals than human beings. And I think that that speaks volumes um, of where society has fallen. Um, you know, the Constitution protects life. Um, you, you look at the, the, the parts that, you know, talk about life and, and, and first and foremost, you know, life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. Um, you know, we hold these truths to be self-evident, um, that we're endowed by rights, by our Creator, uh, that nobody can take away. And I think that once, I think life comes from our Creator. I know it does. And we're endowed with these unalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And I don't think it's up to a human being to take another life, whether it's inside the womb or whether it's outside the womb. And, and how do you deny that it's a human being and that it's a life whenever it has a fetal heartbeat and has all the organs formed? I mean, science tells you that that's a human being. 
Lawmakers finalized a $1,500 pay raise for public school teachers starting July 1st. On the floor of both the House and the Senate, Republican leaders rejected many attempts by Democrats to seek a higher raise. The minority party wanted to resubmit the negotiation and instruct conferees to add a $4,000 raise, $2,000 each year for two years. Joyce Helmick is president of the Mississippi Association of Educators. She and other public education groups urged Republican leaders to consider the $4,000 figure during a press conference in the final days. Helmick says the $1,500 pay raise is not enough to recruit new teachers, especially in areas that are experiencing teacher shortages. We are in crisis mode and we have uh, over 7,000 uh, license issued in 2010 and in 2017 we only had 600. Uh, if, if that's not an indication of a crisis for teachers in a shortage in Mississippi, I don't know what is. Um, we visit schools and we see that the, sometimes half of the faculty uh, substitutes and and uh, uncertified teachers in those classrooms. This is serious. This is serious in our state. And until we get that salary at a point where our educators, our, our new educators want to come into the classroom, we are not going to move this state forward. Helmick says the educators she represents are disappointed with the final outcome and could take out their revenge at the ballot box in the next election. Republican Representative Richard Bennett of Long Beach says they've done all they can. I think we've done the right thing here, and I think we're going to continue to do the right thing. I think we're going to continue to try to get them to the southeastern average. You mentioned the Democrats. I don't want to get into Republican Democrat thing here, but let me tell you, the Democrats were in control for many years, and there were no tax cuts given during their time, and they didn't even come close to getting the teachers to the southeastern average. We're moving in that direction now. We're moving closer to that than whenever they were in charge. So again, look at the facts, not the rhetoric. According to national data, 2018 was the worst year on record for school shootings. In response, lawmakers enacted the Mississippi School Safety Act of 2019. The law would mandate school districts develop and conduct active shooter drills each semester, train teachers and resource officers on how to respond in case of an emergency, and provide money for preventative services like surveillance cameras and metal detectors. But part of the original version did not make it to the governor's desk. A section removed during an earlier debate on the Senate floor would have incorporated classroom instruction in mental illness and mental health as part of a comprehensive school health education program. Lawmakers argued that teaching young children about mental health would do more harm than good. At issue, producer Ashley Norwood talks with Martha Hollingsworth and Doug Copeland about the role mental health plays in preventing an active shooter situation in schools. Hollingsworth is the crisis counselor and mental health specialist for the Rankin County School District. Copeland is the president of the Mississippi Counselor Association and a counselor at Florence Middle School. I think maybe the stigmatism of mental health might keep a student, particularly in middle school, from coming forward. So I'm gonna say that um, I think that helping them <clears throat> overcome the, the country to overcome the stigma of, of mental illness and mental health is critical. Kids share with other kids. And that's a burden that we're trying to teach kids if your friend shares with you that they are struggling and where they're having thoughts of wanting to hurt themselves or others and just, you know, really having struggles dealing with life, there comes a point where you can't help your friend because you're a child yourself. So we're really trying to educate them to come and tell a trusted adult, whether it be their parent or their principal, teacher, counselor, to, to get their friend some help, not to keep those types of secrets when it comes to their friend's safety. And a lot of times, like what we've seen around the country is after those events have occurred, then you have multiple people saying, well, I heard, he, I heard him say this, or they posted this, or they had an obsession with this or that, um, or they were angry, or they had some mental health issues that were or were not diagnosed and treated. But that's after the fact. <clears throat> so if we have all of that in the beginning, 
then we're going to be way ahead of the game and be able to stop things. And that goes back to telling kids, don't keep these secrets whenever your friend could be in danger of harming themselves or others. Like, you've got to come and hand that off, you know, to, the, to adults or the proper authorities. In the last hours of the session, many lawmakers changed their yay votes to nay on a Senate appropriations bill for the Department of Finance and Administration. Unrelated to the department, its appropriations bill included $2 million for education scholarship accounts for students with special academic needs, an addition that many lawmakers said they were unaware of. Several senators tried to remove the ESA appropriation from the bill but failed. Its passage was decided on a voice vote. To force a roll call vote, Senate rules require six members to stand. Republican Lieutenant Governor Tate Reeves said there were only three members standing, but Democratic Senator and Minority Leader Derek Simmons of Greenville disagreed. Here's a clip from the Senate floor. Motion to table the motion reconsider. If you're in favor of the motion, I ask you to vote aye. If you're opposed, I ask you to vote no. All in favor say aye. Any opposed say no. The ayes have it. The motion carries, takes six. There's not sufficient numbers. We will go to the we will go to the next item. There is not sufficient numbers. It requires six, there are three. I can count, Senator Simmons. Please sit down. Nancy Loom is executive director of the Mississippi Parents Campaign. She's calling for more transparency, saying Reeves and other Republican leaders purposely sneaked the two million dollar appropriation into that bill. Word had gotten out in both chambers that this was going to happen, and it had been a topic of discussion all week. Legislators in both parties had told me that they were looking for this language. They had asked numerous questions about this language. They were concerned about it being sneaked into a bill. And so all of the people, the four people who were involved in this, or the five people who were involved in this knew that legislators in both chambers were very concerned about it and still kept it from them. Um, the language was put into the conference report without the knowledge of the others in the chamber. It was filed, the conference report was signed and technically filed at five o'clock in the afternoon on, the, on Thursday. It was not posted online, so legislators could not see it. They had no access to the bill until it was brought up for debate at 519. And the, the debate was rushed. They debated the bill for one minute. Legisla it was a 23-page bill. There were 70 um, appropriations, construction pro appropriations for construction projects in various districts that were listed in that bill, and this was hidden in the middle of them. So legislators had one minute to try to find it. If, if that is not intentionally deceiving the chamber, I'm not sure what, what it is. I just, I think it is indefensible. It clearly was an effort to deceive the members of the chamber because they had been told by legislators in both parties that they were not in favor of that language being in the bill. School choice advocates like Grant Callen of Empower Mississippi see the appropriation as a victory. The group held a rally earlier in the session asking for more money to minimize an existing wait list of families trying to apply for the special needs scholarships. Callen says 428 students are currently receiving scholarship money, but the new investment could open up at least 300 more slots. The legislative process saves all of the, the funding decisions till the very end, and that's what happened in this case. Um, it was no secret that parents across the state from every corner, from the north of the state to the coast, had come to the Capitol, had been at the Capitol multiple times. They had been talking to legislators. They had been advocating for this. Um, we knew, that, so that was no surprise to lawmakers that this there was a need. Uh, it was no surprise to lawmakers that this request was on the table. There'd been a lot of conversation about it. Um, and this is the way the appropriations process works. I mean, every member of the legislature um, has the opportunity to vote on those bills, and they did in these cases. And um, I mean, there's all, you know, there's all kinds of projects in these appropriation bills that go for all kinds of different priorities. And you know, this one was one that clearly was a priority to the Lieutenant Governor, and it was a priority to a lot of members. 
And I applaud them for leading the way and making sure that these kids that were on a waiting list got off of it and got access to a great education. So let's get straight to the point now with views from both sides of the aisle. Brandon Jones is a Democrat. He is an attorney and is a former member of the House. Austin Barber is a Republican national strategist and founder of the Clearwater Group. Gentlemen, good to have you as always. Thank you. Let's start with how the session uh, ended. Uh, Austin, so many people were surprised that, that language uh, went into the bill. Why did the Senate leadership do this? Because it's a priority of theirs. Let me just be real candid today. Brandon and I, and I have discussed this. We did it on radio and MPB earlier this week, and it's obviously an issue that's gotten a lot of attention. And I'm glad that it's a priority of theirs. Uh, we got to give a little history lesson. It'll take 10 seconds. The Clarion Ledger about five years ago did a story on special needs programs throughout the state. And they found that um, our special needs kids were only graduating at a 23% level, which was sort of the foundation for why this program um, was started, a new policy uh, program that was started by the legislature and was funded. Uh, as Grant Callen just said, there are 428 kids that are in the program right now. Um, there, this this uh, extra $2 million would put 300 more kids in it. Uh, I believe just like Tate Reeves believes, just like the majority of, um, I guess, obviously members of the House and of the Senate, that this is important to do. That if you have a child that is in a school district that you feel like cannot meet the educational needs of your special needs child, then you ought to have the right to find another school that could help them, no matter what your income level is, no matter what zip code that you live in. And obviously, the zip code matters because there are not as many uh, independent schools that are out there to meet those needs, but this was a priority of the leadership, and that's why they put the money in there. But why do it at the last minute, at but, the 11th hour like okay, that? Okay, I will tell you why. They were unable to pass a general funding bill for this earlier in the year. That happens with different bills. You know, uh, it may have been a bigger priority for the Senate or the House, and they weren't able to, they weren't able to get it done. But as, as we always say on this show, wait till the very end before we judge them on this particular issue, they found a new way, a new appropriation vehicle to put $2 million in for this. It was, it was education funding dollars that they had at DFA, and they said that's how we're going to use it. And it was their right to do it because they said this is a priority. So what's the harm? Well, look, a hit dog will holler, and we've heard Tate and other Republicans that are very defensive and uptight about this because it was snuck in. I mean, it's, it's really beyond the scale of debate. Austin is right. There was an effort to do this through the front door during the course of the session, and it failed. And so when you can't get something when you talk about it, what do you do? You get it in when they have a minute to read it, and you don't tell House conferees about it. We know House conferees didn't know it was in there because Bill Denny told us, and he was one of the main conferees. So, I mean, look, it, there's no question. This is, a, this is a moment of bad ethics on behalf of the Senate leadership, and it shouldn't have happened. Um, I applaud the folks who tried to turn it around. Some Republicans have taken to social media to apologize to their constituents and say, I'm angry that this was in there. We should know what we're voting on. I think at a minimum, the public's expectation is that their members at least should have an opportunity to know. Sometimes they don't know everything. Sometimes all parts of bills aren't read. But the fact that it was not mentioned on either floor of the House or Senate, that's problematic. You know, then that's before you even get to the merits of the bill. The truth is this program is totally unpenetrable by the state. We have no idea whether children are getting special needs help that they need. We're just taking a special interest group's word for it. There is no oversight. There's no data. The business uh, offices of our state can't tell you exactly what the level of training is. They can't tell you if it's coming from people who are qualified to provide the training. What we do know is that public schools in the state of Mississippi are required to provide a certain degree of special education funding and that in many cases special education uh, professionals who work for public schools are having to provide those services for parochial and other schools. So we all know why these special interest groups wanted to use special education students for this program because they are a sympathetic group and we should be doing what we can to meet their needs. But this is a bit of a Trojan horse and the special interest groups like Mr. Callen, who we just heard from, know that we have no way of truly knowing if this is doing anything at all. I obviously respect my friend across the table here, but I cannot disagree with him any further on just about everything that he just said. First of all, 
I, I think there absolutely must be complete transparency with every dollar that we spend at the state level, including this program. I don't know the details of what um, is is what is available in terms of of the, the the measures and the merits that are coming out from these dollars, and we need to to, to I want to try to figure that out more myself. But I trust the parent. If there's a parent in this school district that we sit in, or in Rankin County, or on the coast, who says, you know what? I, th my school district is not meeting the needs of my special needs kids, and I'm fortunate enough to win that lottery and get into this. I trust them and their ability to say this other school, this independent school is helping them. I, I, I completely trust them. And then last thing real quick, there is a piece of paper that goes in front of every legislator before they vote on an appropriations bill that says, here are all of the items that are in here, itemized out. Most time, legislators will say, what's the one that's most important to mine? Is my district's money in there? And that's what they focus on. So there's, there, th there is transparency of what you are voting on. Um, and I, I, so I just don't understand this sort of sneaking this in. But that's just my opinion. Well, we on found that. out late in the week that the pro program was even misnamed in the bill. So let's assume that you made it to page 17 of 23, which you would have seen was the education savings account. The actual program is the education scholarship. Yeah. So even if you had made it there, you might not have. You might have been thrown off by that. I Fair think. I think at this point we just have to concede because Lieutenant Governor Reeves has essentially said it. Look, I put it in there, yeah. and I'm going to deal with the consequences. That's right. That. The priority of him. So that's right. But I, you know, next year, uh, Wilson, this issue will come up again because the program is set to sunset. And Chairman Tollison tried to get that bill passed in his committee to go ahead and renew it early. It did not pass. Um, and the Senate floor was not interested in renewing it early. And so this will be an issue again because they're going to have to decide whether or not to keep going. Absolutely. Another persistent issue that we discussed at the top of the program was the teacher pay raise. $1,500 was passed. A lot of teachers, other education advocates uh, uh, saying that's not nearly enough. There's a lot of Republicans, rank and file members, who are saying, why did we bring this up if we weren't going to get it in a level that was going to make everybody happy? It would have been much better for everybody if they had waited till the end of the session and said, hey, we found this surplus, we're going to make this amount. Instead, they put a bright spotlight on it from the beginning, said, we're going to do something to really make y'all happy. And they seem to only have succeeded in making the people who it was supposed to affect the most mad. So not their most skillful bit of legislating there. Having said that, um, you know, there's a variety of different programs that should have been looked at, um, including uh, state employees, and we, we didn't see much, we didn't see any increase there to my knowledge, maybe just some limited increase based on certain particular jobs. Um, and then for me, we talked about this before, but the fact that the House totally abandoned the House position in these negotiations is odd. The House voted overwhelmingly to make this a $4,000 increase. Chairman Reed of Appropriations seemed to indicate that was a plausible possible thing that they could do. And the House kind of seemed to abandon that when they got into the negotiation. So a few odd things about it, but you know, at this point, I'm mostly scratching my head over the fact that you made such a big deal about it and just it seemed to succeed in making people angry. State employees did get a 3% pay raise. Was that across the board? Uh, if it, it goes back and looks and see, if they had never gotten a pay raise or a pay raise in the last so odd years, they got a 3% pay raise. If they got a 1% pay raise, Two years ago, they got a two to get them up to three. Mm, okay. There are also other agencies uh, that the legislature said, we're going to give you new authority to give your own pay raises within those particular agencies. But on the teacher pay raise, listen, um, since this group of Republicans uh, who have been in control the last two terms, Phil Bryant, Tate Reeves, and Philip Gunn, teachers on average have gotten a $1,000 pay increase a year. Okay, that's about eight thousand dollars. Obviously, over eight years, there was a there was a twenty five hundred dollar pay increase for all teachers across the board that was passed in two thousand fourteen. Fifteen hundred dollars this year, and then the step increase program uh, has also been passed. Plus, there are also local there are lo, there are, there are counties that give their own incentive dollars to, to teachers. Listen, I believe teachers ought to be paid more. No question about that. But to sit here and blame Republicans that they're not trying to fix this is just not fair and not accurate. I just gave you the facts of how much more a school teacher is making now than they were eight years ago. Is there room to grow this? Is there room to improve this? Absolutely. 
but I like where we're headed right now, and I appreciate the efforts that they've had in the last eight years. Now, most of those increases you just referred to come from step increases, which were not instituted by Republicans. And so I think we have to be careful about the semantics here. But here's the other thing. I don't know why Republicans keep bragging about the money they're putting into public schools other than smoke and mirrors campaign rhetoric, because this is like a losing football team bragging about how much faster its wide receivers are at practice. If we're not paying our teachers as much as Louisiana and Alabama, who cares? The whole point is to be competitive within the market you compete in. So saying we're not quite as slow as we were last year, give us a lot of credit, that falls on deaf ears because the real challenge is when you graduate from a good college, mm -hmm. who is going to get that teacher? And right now we're That's losing right. that teacher. And so everything else is fluff. It's like quit bragging about coming in last but doing it in a sweet and cool way. You still got to beat your opponents, and our opponents are Tennessee, Alabama, and Louisiana. Well, I like your football analogy just real quick. When I look at the scoreboard, I see graduation rates, fourth and eighth grade uh, test scores going up, third grade reading gates. So I like the scoreboard as it is, but it certainly can improve. So we've got about a minute left. I'll give you each 20 seconds on this. We expect new leadership, a lot of new folks next year. What's on your list, of wish list, or what do you expect to see next year, Brandon? Well, we do know, Wilson, we're going to see changes across the board. We're going to see some of these major offices different, governor, lieutenant governor, secretary of state, attorney general. I am most excited at the prospect of Jim Hood being our next governor. This is the best shot Democrats have had in a long time, and it's it's going to be an exciting next several months. This may be like season nine of Game of Thrones for the t in 2020 to see who's actually takes the Iron Throne. Uh, I think Tate Reeves will be our next governor. I think Delbert Hoson will be lieutenant governor. And I hope that they are able to work together and continue to get good things done for conservative governing uh, principles and philosophies. Whatever happens and whoever's in charge, we invite the two of you back to, to join us for another season of At Issue next year. We are out of time for tonight. Don't forget you can watch this program on our website, mpbonline.org slash issue. We invite you to tune in to a season finale of At Issue on MPB Think Radio on Monday morning at 9. Thank you for joining us. Good night.